welcome to the night club guys it's your host the night wrencher i had a little bit of extra time this afternoon i decided to bust out this quick video there's a lot of information in here and uh, it's really hard to condense it as much as possible so i'm going to be talking a little faster than i usually do to try to get through this so bear with me i am going to drag on a little bit so the topic of today is actually 4150 versus 4160 carburetors most people just tend to go with a 4150 for those of you that don't know the difference between a 4150 and a 4160 is that the 4150 has a rear metering block there are two styles of 4160s without metering blocks so you've got like this standard style uh, a lot of budget carburetors brand new even today have no metering block on the back and instead they have what's called the metering plate as like this one right here what this does is it allows you to run a, a pre-calibrated jetting for example this is a uh, the equivalent of a 64 jet and it allows you to run the equivalent size jetting but it's non adjustable there's nothing you can do to this plate really that allow you to run a specific jetting or adjustments when you're when you're trying to tune it for performance and that's for the most part relatively that's tend to be okay because most of these carburetors 4160s are not designed to be you know race style of carburetors these style of carburetors have what's called the side hung float which is the float that kind of looks like this little half moon and it, it's really basic in design it's just a counter spring and gravity pulling and pushing the flow up and down as soon as you got enough fuel it pushes up on the needle and seat closes it as soon as it runs out of fuel it opens back up fuel comes back in same principle applies to the flow bowls on the newer carburetors on the 4150s which is this uh, center hung float you notice that the floats a lot bigger and it trans it actually takes up a lot of space inside the bowl these bowls tend to be a little bit more high capacity, probably a couple cc's more than the uh, older style or uh, 4160 style. And uh, these are more designed for race oriented cars. Uh, if you go into a corner, this type of float tends to uh, even out your fuel level a lot easier than something like this where it pivots off one side. And there are basically two types of the standard 4160 carburetor. There's one that looks like this, and there's one that kind of looks like this. Uh, as I just touched on before, uh, the 4150 style carburetors does have a rear metering block on the back and the 4160 doesn't. But a lot of people and some carburetors come like this from the factory. You can get a float bowl. That's a center hung float bowl. You get a primary side and a uh, secondary side. You and take the stock floats off and then you install these floats, pretty much a direct replacement, and you leave everything else the same. What happens is you convert your system from a single entry to a dual entry setup, and this is called dual feed carburetor. Some people confuse dual feed with double pumper, and I'm going to touch on that in a little bit later. For, for right now, bear with me real quick. Okay, so we've got the single inlet right here. These are actually my preferred type of carburetors for daily driving. They're very compact. They hardly get in the way of any kind of like air cleaner. Definitely the 4150 gets in the way a lot worse than the 4160 does. But you got the single inlet and then you got the transfer tube that goes from the primary side to the secondary side. So all the fuel enters through here and it has to split up in this T inside here. Half the fuel goes here, half the fuel goes there. These are kind of set up so that the front gets filled up before the back does and any extra fuel ends up going to the back. Once both of them are cl uh, closed up, the whole system will start to build pressure into the mechanical fuel pump or electric fuel pump. And then that's where your fuel pressure comes from. So what happens when you install center hung float bowls on a standard 4160 carburetor? This 4160 carburetor, once you eliminate the transfer tube and the single inlet and you convert it to a dual inlet, what happens is now instead of it trying to split inside the bowl, the fuel pressure splits on the rail. So this is um, basically a regular part store rail. I think this was made by Mr. Gasket. These leak like crazy, but they do work after you get it going. If you can get it to stop leaking, uh, these work just fine. Another style that you can use are AN fittings. They sell these conversion fittings that you can go from, from the fittings that used to use uh, this tube. And you can run regular AN fittings, which is my preferred method because you get 
um, pretty much a leak free seal and it's way easier because all the tubes are flexible and you don't have to be for dangling with everything uh, trying to get it on and off especially for tuning I have a hard line on the back side and then I have a soft line in the front so whenever I have to do jets in the front I undo the four screws lift it off just bend it out of the way do whatever I gotta do and then put it back I don't have to be undoing the lines or anything everything's good to go there the main reason to convert your float bowls from side hung to center hung float bowls is basically for fuel distribution. Like I said before, you're teeing it off here. So whatever is left over from the primary side will end up going to the secondary side. In a center hung float, because it's two feeds and everything has the same pressure, both float bowls get filled up at the same time instead of waiting for one and the other. So the fuel distribution is a little bit more consistent uh, than it is on the 4160 uh, standard side hung float bowls. The second biggest reason, like I said before, if this is a road race car or you do a lot of city driving, getting a float bowl that has a float that's a little bit more consistent than the side hung float bowl uh, it's probably a better idea so that way your AFRs can stay more or less consistent as well. The only drawback, like I said before, was that these take a lot more space and you do have to get specific lines, whereas on the 4160, you're able to just plug into the side and you have no big deal. A lot of people don't realize this, but these standard ones, although they're compact, they're lighter, they're easier to work with, the rebuild kits are everywhere, these don't come in mechanical secondary carburetors. Basically, if it's a vacuum secondary, it's a vacuum secondary and it's always going to be a vacuum secondary. On the 4150 style carburetors, you see that you got a squirter on the back side, whereas you don't even have a provision for a squirter on this side. And if you really, really wanted to turn, convert this to a vacuum secondary, if you drill the right passages, you can get it to, I don't see why you would, but if you really wanted to, you would, you could. Uh, base plates for a vacuum secondary, mechanical secondary are pretty much the same. So you can actually swap base plates, swap, you know, float bowls and everything to get it all in place. You cannot do that with the 4160. Not only do you not have the provision for the accelerator pump squirter, you also don't have the provision for the accelerator pump cam or the levers. As you can see, there's nothing there. There should be a hole here for your uh, accelerator pump um, lever, but as you can see, no such thing on this style of carburetor. There are conversion kits, so you can convert your 4160 to a 4150 carburetor. All of this basically applies to vacuum secondary carburetors because, like I said before, you won't be able to turn this into a double pumper ever because it doesn't have the provisions. But if you, let's say you had this one, this is an 1850. This was on a ton of different Ford vehicles. Uh, maybe some Chevy and Dodge vehicles, but unlikely. A lot of Ford vehicles had the trusty old 1850 600 CFM carburetor. Let's say you want to turn this more into a race oriented carburetor so you remove the choke tower right so you can get that extra cfm then you go ahead and remove the bowls just like um, i did here and then you're going to go ahead and convert the system to center hung float bowls but then you have two options on metering for the secondary side. I did mention earlier that you have metering plates that are pre-calibrated settings for your carburetor. They act as your main jets since you don't actually have jets in this carburetor. To fully convert your 4160 to a 4150 carburetor, you're going to have to go ahead and remove the secondary side completely. So you're going to remove the float bowl. You're going to remove these six screws and you're going to go ahead and basically toss this in the trash. Metering for these carburetors is very difficult. The plates are very expensive and jets are readily available so it really doesn't make any sense. They do make conversion plates. You can buy the plate by itself and it's got these holes drilled on the bottom and then you can actually have adjustable jets. But your IFRs are not adjustable, uh, your air bleeds are not adjustable and you have a bunch of other issues associated so I don't typically recommend the plates uh, if you want to go full race I do recommend getting yourself a secondary metering block so the difference between a secondary metering block and a primary metering block is that typically the secondary metering block won't have any kind of provision for the vacuum and then if it's a two corner idle it'll only have the idle in the front and not in the back so there are a couple different variations uh, if you wanted a power valve in the back 
Typically, you don't really want that, but if you wanted a power valve in the back, you can go ahead and add the power valve. Uh, everything else is functionally the same. You've got air bleeds, you've got idle feed restrictors. If this had a power valve, it would have power valve channel restrictors, etc. If it is a four corner idle, you're gonna have provisions for the two screws to have four corner idle. This is a two corner idle secondary uh, with no provision for a vacuum. You could drill this out and add a provision if you wanted to. I typically don't recommend that you do, but you know, you can do whatever you want with your carburetor. <laughs> so basically you've got the secondary side of your carburetor. I know this is the primary side, but bear with me. So the secondary metering block fits pretty much the same as your primary metering block. The dimples are in the same place and everything installs the same. So you would install the appropriate gasket in the back, the bull gasket in the front. Just lay this over here. It usually comes with the set of jets already. You throw those in there, you put your bowl over this, and then now you go ahead and pick up one of these bad boys and you hook it up together. And now you've got a 4150 carburetor. Okay, so the big question is, you have a 4160 carburetor, should you convert it to a 4150 carburetor? And the short answer is no, but there is a caveat. The main reason why you shouldn't is because of the cost. For the amount that it's going to cost you to buy the metering block for the back, the two bowls, the fuel rail, make sure you got the screws and the floats and you get your set of jets going, uh, you could probably buy another used carburetor like a 476, 4776, 4777 and be on your merry way, basically the same carburetor. Uh, or if you wanted a different size carburetor, you can do that as well. Be a little bit more hands-on, understand a little bit more of how it works, put it together, put it on your car and go. So then after it's all said and done, you'll have two carburetors instead of one and a half carburetors. The only reason I would probably recommend switching over from a 4160 to a 4150 in terms of conversion is if you've invested money into the main body of a 4160. What do I mean by that? If you've gone and you have this carburetor perfectly tuned, your front metering block, the IFRs are good, your PVCRs are good, your jets are good, um, you've got everything good on the primary side, you've went ahead and invested on adjustable air bleeds, you've went ahead and maybe swapped out the boosters, maybe you've, chill, you've went ahead and milled out and had uh, somebody mill out the choke plate. Those are all good reasons of why you should keep your main body and just swap over the extras, especially if you're going to be racing it. Vacuum secondary carburetors are not ideal for racing because it's very inconsistent in the revs and how you accelerate from point A to point B. Uh, it's very inconsistent versus a mechanical secondary that it will do whatever you tell it to do. Vacuum secondary carburetors are not only for fuel economy, but also to control um, detonation, make sure you're not running too much air when you're not pulling enough fuel, make sure you're not running the engine too low. So if you've invested money into the main body of your carburetor, I would definitely do whatever I can to go ahead and keep the carburetor that you have going on right now. Like I said, I do understand why people would go ahead and convert them especially if you've already tapped out all the power potential of your 4160 and that secondary side needs more tunability more fuel more adjustable everything uh, that would be the number one reason why you would want to if you're not facing those kinds of issues if you like the simplicity if you like how light it is and compact it is i would definitely in a heartbeat keep your 4160 carburetor but that about does it i know it's been a really long video if you guys have any questions just go ahead and post them down below i will see you guys all in the next one night wrencher out